Every once in a while, you do get lucky enough to come across a weapon that looks like it belongs both in the real world and in the realms of fantasy. And this is truly one of those. This is a bronze Southeast Asian cannon. We don't know exactly when it was made, but we reckon it was made in the early to mid 1700s, maybe the late 1600s. It's one of the most iconic pieces in the Fort Nelson collection. And just look at the detailing on this thing. It is 2.8 meters long from nose to tail, which is one of the few cannons in this place I can say that with. Um, and its caliber or the size of the barrel is about 94 millimeters. Now, before I get any further and talk about the, uh, the nature of this object, we should probably talk about how this gun ends up here. And it's not a happy story, but it is important to know. So this gun is one of the guns that was captured by the British Army in its invasion of Myanmar, the Third Anglo-Burmese War of 1885. Now, over the course of the 1800s, the British had been slowly and steadily eroding the control of the Burmese government. And in 1885, the fact that the Burmese were trying to levy extra taxes on a British teak company gave them an excuse to issue an ultimatum that they knew they were never going to accept and invade. Two weeks of fighting, the British army was outside the capital, and this was one of the guns that was taken when the Burmese ultimately surrendered. This gun is a set of four, and we don't know where all of them are now, but this particular gun was given to the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII. Um, he gives it to the Royal Armouries later in his life, and it's been with us ever since. So it is obviously a British war trophy, but that's probably not the only war trophy it is. The documents that I've been researching seem to suggest that the Burmese actually had this as a war trophy as well. When the Burmese invaded Siam in the 1760s, we believe this is one of the guns taken from there due to some of the documents that we've been able to uncover. We don't know whether it's Siamese made. The design is a little bit unclear. The design is very obviously Chinese inspired. And while the Siamese definitely had one of the largest Chinese immigrant populations at the time, we just don't know who made it. There's no maker's mark or inscription to give us any clue. And there is still an air of mystery about it that I think is very appealing today. Our gun is a muzzle loader. It loads from the front. You place the cannonball and the gunpowder down the barrel at the front. And then from there, you use the touch hold at the back to light it. And from there, it fires whoosh. We don't know how powerful this gun could be. Caliber wise, it's comparable to a British six pounder gun. It would have been made around about the same time. But the people who use this were using their own recipes and supplies for gunpowder. And we just don't know what they are. If you do know, then please let us know. I'd be really interested to find out. But the guns that the Europeans had could have had an accurate range of maybe 550 meters. How that applies to this gun, we just don't know. It's a little bit difficult to say exactly what this gun could be used for because on the one hand, you've got a perfectly practical and usable general purpose field gun, even if it does look a little bit ornate. On the other hand, of course, like why would you want to use this gun? It's far too pretty to be used. And the rule is, if it is too pretty to be used, no one wants to use it, at least in my book anyway. So uh, the idea is this would be probably placed as a status symbol or a piece of ceremony. The only use that I can think of that this gun probably had is as a use in ceremonial events. In Southeast Asia, cannons were a key part of various ceremonies, whether it's the crowning of a new monarch or the arrival of a new ruler or maybe religious ceremonies or something like that. These guns would sound off as part of those and demonstrate the power of the ruler indeed. Although it has to be said, this close connection between kings and cannons in Southeast Asia did backfire on them a little bit. The focus of the kings on hoarding large amounts of cannons meant that they didn't really want to share them out to people who might use that against them, which included their own vassals and their own soldiers. 
And one of the reasons why Southeast Asian artillery never got as good as European artillery is because the kings kept their cannons to themselves, only giving them out to their untrained levies when they absolutely needed to in times of war. It's fairly apt though, I think, that this gun is cast in the shape of a dragon. And if you're watching this in the West, you're probably agreeing with me because you're thinking, well, cannons make lots of fire, dragons breathe fire. Makes sense, right? But that's not actually how Asians, and particularly Southeast Asians, would have thought about it. Dragons in those cultures are associated with water, and they are largely benevolent creatures, symbols of good luck. That still doesn't mean that you should, you know, treat them badly. The same power that can produce rains can also produce storms and floods, and they are pretty destructive. So it's better to have the dragons in your corner than anybody else. The reason why I think this is so fitting is because dragons are symbols of royal power, the powers of kings and emperors. So therefore, if you've got a cannon as a symbol of kingship and dragons as a symbol of kingship, they go together like a glove. We don't know who this was made for. We don't even know exactly when it was made, but we can at least rule out the Chinese government with this. Um, because if you look very closely at the legs of our dragon gun and count the number of claws on it, you'll notice there's three front claws and one back claw for a total of four. For the Ming and Qing dynasties that ruled China around the same time as we think this gun was made, the symbol of the dragon is a five-clawed dragon. A five-clawed dragon it can only be used by the emperor, so it probably wasn't designed for them. But whoever it was must have been incredibly powerful and wealthy to afford one of these. Maybe a foreign ruler, maybe a lesser noble, but we just don't know. The thing that really interested me about this gun, I must admit, came from ironically watching the film Raya and the Last Dragon, because having been told that this gun was Burmese made and seeing Sisu, who is a Southeast Asian style dragon in that, you can see that they don't look like each other at all. It's very Chinese inspired. And this quest for why does this gun look like it has turned into essentially a year long project that I am still nowhere near close to finding the answers to. We can track it back as far as Siam, but unfortunately the paper records dry up and there are so many dragon guns in Southeast Asia, at least in the maritime world, that it's very difficult to try and pinpoint exactly where this gun comes from. But the quest still continues, we will do our best, and we'll see if we can find any clearer picture on this gun in the future. If you have any ideas about where this dragon gun came from, do let us know. I would be very interested to hear your thoughts and theories about exactly where or when this dragon gun could be made. At the back of the gun, just below the tail, you've got a very, very ornate, well, to use the technical term, a knob at the back. The tail is really interesting because it's the site of the biggest bit of damage on this gun. In fact, the tail should actually come a little bit further up, so it should look even more impressive than it does now. Coming along the spines, you've then got the touch hole or the vent, which is actually raised up in between the signs, possibly to make it easier to put the gunpowder inside. Following the spines along, we open out the legs, and then in the center of the gun, the trunnions, the two large bits where it would be fixed to some type of carriage. Another two set of legs go after that, and then finally you get to the muzzle, the head of the dragon, which is so ornate, I can't even think of things to talk about with this. There are so many patterns and so many methods they must have used to make this. It just staggers belief. Thank you ever so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and comment on this video. And remember that the Royal Armouries is a charity, so there'll be a link to donate in the comments down below. Uh, if you want to come and see this dragon up close and personal, the Royal Armouries Fort Nelson is free to visit on Tuesdays through to Sundays. We would love to see you. Thank you very much. We'll see you with another object soon.